Good morning, everyone. I'm Steve Rosansky, President and CEO of the Newport Beach Chamber of Commerce, and I want to welcome you to our monthly Government Affairs Committee meeting. We've got a great little program for you here. Uh, you can see Mike uh, to my well, it's to my left on my screen. I don't know how it is on your screen with a big CRNR trash truck back there, which uh, lets us know that he is from CRNR, and uh, Rush will introduce him, um, read his bio, and all that. Um, before we get going, I'll just make a couple of quick comments. Uh, Mike's going to make his presentation, 20, 25 minutes, and then he's uh, allowed for some time at the end for Q&A. So if you have any questions or you think of any as Mike's making his presentation, please type them into the Q&A box. Please type them into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, and we'll try and get to all those questions um, at the end. Uh, once that part of the program is complete, we should be uh, receiving updates from at least three of the four elected offices. I'm still waiting to hear from the fourth one, but, uh, and they'll give five minute uh, presentations on what's happening um, in their area of the world. So with that being said, I will turn this over to my compadre here, Rochelle, and he'll introduce our special guest for today. Thank you, Steve, and uh, welcome everybody to our April meeting of governmental affairs. Uh, we're glad uh, to have you all with us. Uh, we have uh, uh, an interesting uh, uh, speaker today that uh, is in a business that certainly is picking up with the environment. Uh, uh, that was a joke if you got it. But um, anyway, I'm very pleased to introduce to you Mike Carey. He's a senior sustainability coordinator at CRNR Environmental Services, and he's supporting contract and regulatory compliances for the cities of Newport Beach and Costa Mesa. Mike began his career in sustainability at Orange Coast College in 1985 and has spent 35 years in shaping environmental policy and nationally recognized programs for the college, as well as teaching courses in architecture and environmental studies. As a current US Green Building Council True Zero Waste Advisory Council member and former member of the board of U.S. Zero Waste Business Council and the California Recovery Association, Resource Recovery Association, Mike has been at the forefront in environmental issues for several decades. Mike lives in Costa Mesa where he is a board member for the Costa Mesa Foundation and past chair of the Costa Mesa Sanitation District Citizens Advisory Committee. In his spare time, he enjoys sports, music, and cooking. We're pleased to have Mike with us this morning. Mike, the show is yours. Thank you, Rush. Um, let me pull up my PowerPoint here. Um, as Rush mentioned, I've been in the environmental business for a long time. Um, uh, again, I'm responsible for the regulatory compliance reporting for Newport Beach and Costa Mesa. Um, I've been with CRNR for nine months now. My, I should mention my first experience working in the environment or waste industry in general was at 10 years old, picking up cans and bottles at, um, at the Back Bay. So I've uh, been interested in it for a long time. Um, a little background about CRNR. It's, we were established in 1963. We're still a family owned and operated operation. CRNR has over 2,000 employees, um, over 3.1 million customers, 55 municipal contracts, and more than 20 anaerobic digestion contracts, which we'll talk about here in a minute. Um, to give you a kind of a brief background of how we got to where we are now legislatively and specifically here in California, um, Back in the day, in the 60s and 70s, tr trash was a fairly linear process. It was picked up at the home and transferred almost directly to the landfills. Um, our local landfills here kind of, back in the 70s, looked similar to what you see there on the right-hand side of your screen, where trash was just uh, dumped out in the empty canyon. Um, our local landfills here, Here's kind of a listing of them. The Coyote Canyon landfill was in Newport Beach and operated from 1963 to 1990. Um, 
that was closed. I'll show you a photo of that area here in a minute. Um, I remember vividly as a kid going to that landfill in the 70s um, with, my, with my buddy's father. Most of the time we would end up coming back from the landfill with more items than we went there with. Um, you know, we, as Orange County residents, we throw away a lot of really good stuff. Uh, but now with the current landfills, uh, residents are not allowed to go there personally. Um, Coyote Canyon closed. That was along the where Newport Coast Road is right now, or Newport Coast Drive. Um, uh, that's where the Coyote Canyon landfill was. Now the primary landfill that our area uses is the Frank Bowerman, Frank R. Bowerman landfill in Irvine, located. It's roughly off of Sand Canyon between the 405 and the 5 freeways. Um, you can hardly, you wouldn't even really know it's there if you drive along that, that stretch. And again, residents are not allowed to um, go to the facility. And that was opened in 1990. Projected closing is 2053. Um, other Orange County landfills are the Olinda Alpha Landfill, a lot of times referred to as a Brea Olinda Landfill. That opened in 1960, estimated closing in 2030. And in San Juan Capistrano, we have the uh, Prima Duchea Landfill with an estimated um, closing date of 2102. Um, here's a photo of the old, this is credited to the Orange County Register um, this past December. Uh, this is the site of the old Coyote Canyon landfill. It's currently uh, slated to be turned into a municipal uh, public golf course. Um, I know this slide is kind of difficult to see, but this is courtesy of the county. This is a, um, a chart that they've used for a long time, uh, referred to as the anatomy of a landfill. I had mentioned before with the old style landfills where, where trash was simply uh, dumped and spread out and kind of covered at the end of the day. Um, with some of those old landfills, it created problems with what's referred to as leachate. The, that is the um, material that would seep through the landfill and potentially contaminate the groundwater supply that you see at the bottom of the of this slide. Um, and the, I always refer to that process of, as kind of like a um, drip coffee machine, if you can imagine the uh, liquid and rainwater and moisture um, entering the landfill, seeping through, collecting all the contaminants um, from both legally and e illegally dumped materials in the landfill, seeping down and again, potentially uh, polluting the groundwater supply. Um, and then trying to, the problems were also trying to capture the methane gas, which is the natural uh, component of decomposing garbage. Um, with current landfills, the way they're constructed, they're referred to as sanitary landfills, which doesn't sound like those two words should go together. But with a sanitary landfill, they, they begin with a canyon, at the, at the bottom of it, they, they cover that with a layer of clay. You can see it's as compacted clay at the bottom of the slide. Um, and then they cover it with a layer of plastic so nothing leaks out of the landfill. Um, modern landfills also have a sophisticated methane gas capturing component to harness um, the landfill gases and use those for other sources. It kind of protects the environment as much as possible. At the end of the day at the landfill, they we'll talk about this in a minute too, they co cover the landfill um, so that to protect garbage from flying out or uh, from the wind, from uh, birds and other animals getting into the garbage and so forth. To keep, uh, in an effort to keep it clean, they do have to cover it at the end of every day. Um, in the 1990s, because of regulation, the, the state implemented laws mandating uh, landfill diversion. 
Um, that created the process by which instead of being a linear concept where the trash is taken directly to landfill, it would go to a, a materials recovery facility or a MRF. Um, there are two different types of MRFs that are used in, in CRNR operates both different types. Uh, one is referred to as a clean MRF, one is a dirty MRF. That's kind of the industry jargon. Um, dirty would be more for materials that are all collected together. So all of your, all the trash and all the recycling and all the organic material all collected together. And then it's uh, manually and mechanically separated at the materials recovery facility. A clean MRF is more for materials, um, kind of like you have in Newport Beach where the recycling can contains only mixed recyclables and then those are uh, processed and, and recycled. It's a, there's much more recovery available in the clean process than in the, in the dirty process. You can see at the bottom of the slide, um, I'll go more in depth, but that would be the, the daily cover of the landfill that we talked about, how it, you have to cover the garbage at the end of the day with, with some type of material. Um, so your waste in Newport and Costa Mesa and any of our other clients goes to our materials recovery facility where again, it's manually and mechanically separated. That slide at the top right is just an example. That is not our facility. Um, you can see some of the outdoor processing of the, of the recyclables uh, being baled and compacted, processed and getting ready to be shipped to market. Um, I mentioned the legislation. This is a slide that's provided by the city. I've seen this a couple different times and it's one of my favorite slides. So thank you, Newport Beach. Um, this is kind of the evolution of the state recycling laws um, that have come to pass in the recent years. Um, in 1989, the state passed Assembly Bill 939, which at the time seemed very aggressive. It stated that um, municipalities had to recycle up to 50% up to of their materials by the year 2000 or face a $10,000 a day fine. That seemed um, a very lofty goal at the time, but it was achieved by um, reporting, recycling, and different mechanisms to be able to get municipalities to reach that 50% um, threshold. Um, some cities struggled with that, and I, do, I don't believe many, if any, fines of that $10,000 per day were issued at the time. Um, the state then went on to pass uh, Assembly Bill 341, which mandated commercial recycling by 2012, with a goal of 75% diversion by 2020. And uh, that was a very strong piece of legislation that that kind of made our MRFing process very important to our, our business customers to be able to provide those services, reclaim the materials that were already in the bins that they were uh, setting out for service and helping um, the business and the city get to achieve their diversion goals. Um, the state then went on to pass Assembly Bill 1826 which uh, mandated commercial organics recycling by 2020 with a goal of 50% reduction in organics uh, disposal by 2020. Um, that goal wasn't, it was implemented, not, not necessarily meant, so it wasn't met full on. Um, the state kind of tightened up the regulations over um, the thresholds of who is um, not liable, but who, what businesses need to be able to participate in that. The threshold of their waste generation um, was reduced to two cubic yards for uh, businesses that needed to be responsible for doing that. Um, 
Assembly Bill 1594. So that was a landfill alternative daily cover. Uh, daily, daily cover is no longer considered diversion in 2020. And what that means, as I've now mentioned twice, the uh, daily cover at the landfill. Um, up until 2020, the state allowed for organic materials, like your lawn clippings, food waste, um, any organic material, to be countered as diversion if uh, the operators of the landfill were covering the landfill with that organic material. It's uh, covering the landfill with this organic material didn't really meet the goals or the spirit of the intention of diverting waste from the landfill. If the, these organic materials are going to the landfill anyway and are being used as a daily cover, again, that doesn't necessarily satisfy the spirit of what the legislation was intended to do. So the state took out that, that um, the ability for landfills and municipalities to be able to count the, the organic waste as diversion. A typical figure is that 40% of municipal solid waste is organic waste. So we, it's difficult to meet these mandates without addressing the need to divert organic material. And without the alternative daily cover, um, exemptions, cities and municipalities and haulers are kind of challenged with what to do with all of this material. Um, the strongest piece of legislation that's been passed that all of the cities are um, scrambling to, to meet the requirements of is uh, Senate Bill 1383. And that requires all homes and businesses to recycle organic waste by uh, January 1st, 2022. Um, the state is being very aggressive with this mandate. They're also mandating that um, municipalities and cities develop a uh, mechanism to have financial implications to uh, businesses or residents who are not uh, complying with this mandate. The, the state seems to be um, aggressively pursuing this avenue to be able to have the cities develop these programs and have them implemented by this coming January 1st. Um, which brings us to our Newport Beach program. Um, because of that state legislation, there has to be organics collection at home and, and at businesses. Um, in Newport Beach, currently, all of the residential refuse is being handled by CRNR. Businesses are um, free to solicit their own waste hauler um, out of a list that, uh, of approved haulers that the city has. Uh, businesses can select their, their own hauler, but businesses will also be uh, mandated to have this organics um, and food waste recycling program and diversion program. There's also uh, part of the legislation addresses the uh, collection and distribution of edible, excess edible food um, coming from restaurants and hotels and caterers and so forth. Um, so currently in Newport Beach, we have the, uh, the black cans for your uh, trash and other waste. Um, Currently, there's a recycling bin available to Newport Beach residents. Uh, that's an opt-in program right now. Um, the city estimates that 75% of the residents participate in the, the recycle can um, program. But again, January 1st, we'll be required to have an organics collection program. So where does the organic waste go? Um, the CRNR has invested quite heavily in an anaerobic digestion facility located in Paris. Um, that's Paris, California, not France. Um, so all of the organic waste is uh, taken to Paris and converted into several things. Let's see, here's, a, here's kind of a flow chart of the anaerobic digestion system. Uh, it takes the organic solid waste, organic liquid waste, um, Think of it as kind of a flux capacitor, like in Back to the Future, where we're taking garbage and turning it into resources. 
Um, all of the organic waste is, is processed through the main digester, um, filtered, goes to post-digestion for either gas upgrading for renewable natural gas to fuel vehicles, um, and it can be upstaged to go out into regular renewable natural gas. Um, the other elements of the anaerobic digestion program are converted into liquid soil amendments and solid soil amendments. We believe that, that anaerobic digestion is better for the environment than just traditional composting. A lot of people ask, why, why aren't we just simply composting it and turning it back into soil amendments? Um, uh, Typical windrow composting programs are difficult to get um, to get approved because of air quality concerns. Not to mention the the land required to do that. Land is obviously at a premium. Um, regular landfilling of the organic waste with the mechanisms that I described in the current sanitary landfills can only equate to 75% uh, energy recovery by recovering the landfill gases. Uh, it can equate to 75% of the emissions capture, but none of the nutrient recovery. Um, composting is zero energy recovery, zero emissions capture, but 100% nutrient recovery. Anaerobic digestion will actually provide 100% recovery over all three categories. Um, so again, we've taken this, what was once the linear program of take, make, waste and taking it to the landfill um, and now making it a, a, a more thoughtful system where the uh, recyclables are first pulled out, the organics are pulled out, converted into the renewable natural gas and fertilizer, and then just the residual left is what is taken to the landfill. So it's heavily processed to be able to uh, recover the most amount of materials possible. Um, our anaerobic digestion system is estimated, projected to uh, create 4 million gallons of renewable natural gas um, and provide 260,000 tons of organic compost. We've made significant investments um, to be able to have our fueling stations, both in Paris, San Juan Capistrano, and Garden Grove, um, with a 20-year station lifespan. And uh, we're Stanton and Colton are pending renewable natural gas fueling stations. You can see our trucks lined up right there overnight, fueling up with the RNG. The key components to, to trying to meet these mandates, um, especially the new organics ones coming up, is the elimination of contamination. Um, up until recently, the, the majority of the recyclable material in, in the US and particularly from the West Coast was being um, exported to China. Uh, China has implemented what's referred to as national sword. I'm, don't, I'm sure you, some of you have heard of that, but the China was paying premium prices to take inferior quality um, materials from the, from the US and other countries for a long, long time. They got to a point where the contamination of the materials coming in was so great and they were left with so much residual waste at the end of their process that they tightened up the restrictions um, a lot of the waste that they were, were receiving and being imported into China was between 25 and 30 percent contamination. Um, it was very difficult for, it would be difficult for anybody to process materials with that degree of, of contamination. Um, China had set very strict um, quality requirements, making the, the contamination uh, quotient to be, it needed to be half, one half of 1%, which is almost impossible to reach. Um, China has since put a complete ban on the importing of any waste materials. 
So the U.S. and other countries are really scrambling trying to figure out uh, where to take this waste, in um, the recyclable waste. It, it's provided some challenges and some opportunities. Some of the U.S. Um, markets are opening back up. There was a lot of paper mills that had closed down in the U.S. once uh, China had begun taking our materials. Some of those are opening back up. It's um, or retooling to be able to handle the, the fiber waste that's coming in. There are some encouraging innovations in recycling some plastics, but again, uh, avoiding contamination or eliminating it as much as possible is the key to being able to meet these aggressive waste diversion goals. Um, that on our part, that will require a lot of education, both for residents and for businesses. For our uh, business customers that have food waste programs, we provide education and training to show what can and cannot go into those bins. Uh, obviously, the, the best program or the, the best strategy to avoid waste is not to create it in the first place. Uh, that would be the, the reduce component of reduce, reuse, recycle. Uh, but for what's left for, for food prep, we'll, we provide training materials and outreach on what can go into these um, organics bins and food waste collection bins and what cannot. Um, training for uh, back of house prep staff and, and Kitchen staff is key to making this successful. Uh, getting the buy-in from, from the employees and from management top-down is uh, paramount to the success of the programs. Um, again, eliminating contamination. Here's the et, uh, edible food waste. You can see a lot of that looks pretty good, but there's, there's contamination in there too. So again, eliminating the contamination is the the key element. Um, I'd like to, as we're kind of closing out, I'd like to highlight some of the other programs that we offer to Newport Beach. The, the more that I talk to the residents, the more that I realize uh, how many people don't even realize that we, these programs are offered through the city and through CRNR. Uh, we do have a household hazardous waste collection program where you can schedule a truck to come to your home and pick up things like paint, electronic waste, uh, many sharps, uh, fluorescent tubes, aerosol cans, batteries, and so forth. Uh, that's a free program that's available to the residents. Um, that does not include construction and demolition debris, however. Um, some neat programs that we have coming up uh, or neat events that we are sponsoring with the city is we're doing another free document shredding and e-waste disposal event. That's gonna be happening at Harbor Day School. We did an identical event there in October. Um, so residents can bring their, their electronic waste, uh, 10, up to 10 boxes of shredding. Now that uh, you have a little delay in fi filing your taxes, um, you can wait and bring your all of your documents on April 24th. That'll be April 24th from 8 to noon at Harbor Day School off of Pacific View Drive. Uh, proof of Newport Beach residency will be required. We're also happy to note that we will be doing a compost giveaway. We had one scheduled in Newport last April 4th, but we all know what happened a couple of weeks before that, so that was canceled. We're coming back and doing another compost giveaway um, Saturday, June 5th at the Oasis Senior Center. Um, residents are gonna be mailed postcards for that here in the very near future. And again, proof of residency will be required. Um, okay, the educator in me requires that I tell you that um, Earth Day is actually a week from today. April 22nd. This will be the 51st anniversary of Earth Day. Um, there sh should have been big programs scheduled last year, but again, the pandemic kind of put those on hold. 
What you may not know about Earth Day is that the, the inspiration for Earth Day was, or the, the event that kind of triggered environmental awareness was actually an oil spill in Santa Barbara in 1969, um, our coastal neighbors to the north. It was a huge oil spill, over 3 million gallons of oil spilled into the ocean um, um, and triggered awareness and protest and, and people really sprung into action to try and address environmental issues. Um, so again, that's our, our coastal connection to Earth Day. Uh, this, that slide's courtesy of the LA Times. Um, it's, it's referencing another oil spill that happened um, in 2015 off the coast of Santa Barbara, which um, was pretty massive, but it was only, only 105,000 gallons uh, compared to the 3 million gallons in the spill in 1969. Um, there is my contact information that kind of concludes my presentation. Again, we'll do some questions. Let me get out of here and free up um, the screen. All right, Steve, you're back. Yeah, that was a great presentation. Learned a lot about uh, the uh, flow of uh, the trash from our house right into the landfill or the digesters. Um, we do have some questions here. So um, the first one is asking, can we get a copy of your slide deck? So um, if you're willing to make it available to us, we'll make sure that it gets out to people. Uh, we are recording the, the presentation and that will be um, on our website uh, most likely uh, today or tomorrow. Okay. So uh, is, would it be possible to have the slide deck? Sure. Okay, sure. great. Um, so let's get to the first question. <laughs> it says, interesting to learn the evolution of the landfill but what are the new rules applicable to Newport Beach residents? So I think we covered that and how it will be collected. It says, but where will our trash cans be stored? So, uh, you know, I, I struggle with this. Uh, you know, I own a couple of properties in Newport Beach and, and you know, we got, you know, have a three foot setback on our side yards and most people don't want to keep their trash cans in their garage if they can avoid it because of the smell and flies and things like that, vermin. So they're looking to store it on the side of their house, but um, has anything been settled yet as far as what new, what the trash receptacles will look like for Newport Beach when it comes to uh, this new program that we have to implement by the end of the year? You know, you're absolutely right. It's, it's challenging with this, the smaller properties and especially the alleyway collection. Um, we're currently working with uh, Newport Beach to with the city to kind of develop the nuances of what that's going to look like in both the collection uh, collection carts and vehicles that'll be servicing those areas. We're we're actively working uh, with the city on that right now. Okay, uh, we got another question here from uh, Jim Mosier. Jim wants to know. In our cities, what's the ratio of organic waste generated by businesses versus homes? Do you happen to know that? I, I don't have the um, current waste characterizations from, from Newport in front of me. I, I don't know the answer to that question, Jim. All right, Jim's got another one here. Uh, regarding state legislation, diversion rates mean little if the volume of waste increases. Isn't there also a goal to limit the per capita the number of pounds per person of the amount of landfill waste? Well, the state has been kind of gauging um, uh, waste generation on a per capita basis. And it, to be honest, I think those numbers are gonna be uh, surprising the more that the impact of the pandemic is, is developed. We have made, as an industry and society, we have made some pretty decent changes to, to shift the needle from single use disposable products and doing reusable products and reducing the amount of single use. Um, the pandemic really flipped that on, a, on its head right now. So we're, at, we're at, a, at a crossroads where we're trying to create less waste, but, but now restaurants and other facilities and the PPE that's going into the, into the waste stream is currently creating a lot more single-use waste and non-recyclable waste than we had um, had two years ago. So I don't think a lot of those numbers and, and figures have come back yet, but um, we shouldn't underestimate the impact of these um, 
single use items. For, for the year during the pandemic, um, uh, the, the waste stream is, evolved between business and, and residential in that, um, you know, our, our business customer waste has kind of gone down while our residential waste has gone up. Um, businesses that were creating waste are now take, providing, like restaurants, providing to-go containers to residents that now are appearing in the residential waste stream that had not been there in those types of quantities uh, prior to the pandemic. Um, so we're kind of evaluating the impacts of all of that. You know, along those lines, what's happening with all those Amazon boxes that people are getting at their home? <laughs> I think that's the big thing. That's what's filling up a lot of the, the um, uh, residential containers right now. Um, we're pulling a lot of those out. At least the, the cardboard market is kind of picking up right now. So it provides us a better opportunity to be able to recover those materials. But I think even Amazon, there's a push to get Amazon to um, drivers to collect boxes from residents and take them take them back for reuse from Amazon. There's a push to do that right now. Jim has another question that's come in and that's uh, why are Newport Beach residents being told they need three carts to meet the state goals when CR and our customers in Costa Mesa are told they can achieve over 60% diversion with two. Well, Co Costa Mesa is um, looking into providing the th uh, three cart system. The, the difference right now in between Costa Mesa and Newport Beach is that Costa Mesa has a, a single cart for waste and they have had an organic cart for several years now. To be able to achieve those goals, as I mentioned before, with 40% of the waste estimated waste stream being organic material, you can't get to the 75% without addressing organics. Um, that's the component that's missing from Newport right now is, is the organics. Um, Costa Mesa is able to get closer to that goal by already having the organics cart. So, so is there other cart is recyclables and just regular trash? Is that how that, and then you guys separated at the MRF? Is that what happened? Correct, correct. But the, the recovery is, is less because of the contamination. Right. So are they gonna have to change their process as well? Or they're, they're, gonna... they're, they're exploring that. Exploring that, okay. Um, all right, let's move on to another question. Is, is a household office shredder paper waste considered recyclable, recyclable or should it be discarded as straight waste? <laughs> That's a question I get all the time. Um, um, I think it's recyclable. We've been, I, I've been able to successfully recycle that in the past and I would continue to do so. I do that, I do that with mine. Okay. I have a question. Uh, has there been any consideration given to the fact that, that with this program, we now have three trucks driving to every residence instead of one. Uh, and uh, do you anticipate that there'll be some people that just on this uh, uh, organic uh, dump their garbage straight into the CRNR container without it being in a bag first or anything, uh, creating animal problems? Uh, uh, that uh, we did not have before as far as vermits uh, running around from trash can to trash can? Um, well, there, there will be additional trucks that would have to pick up the materials. So currently, um, you know, you're having a truck pick up the, the waste and then a truck pick up the recycling. There would have to be an organics truck to come and pick up the organic material. Um, are, are you asking if there's a vermin problem with the, um, with the organic waste in the organic bin? And well, no, I mean, do you suddenly have rats coming around uh, uh, smelling this organic waste and, and that type of thing, coyotes? Uh, is there an issue with that? And with three trucks driving around on our roads, uh, that obviously will increase our uh, our repair time and, and this type of thing. Almost on cue, my organics cart is getting picked up in front of my house right now. 
Mayor. Um, <laughs> well, so the, well, let's maybe I'll follow up with a question on that. So if you have the organics cart, and a lot of that, at least for homes, is going to be food waste, stuff that you know you scrape off your plate when you're done with dinner. So are you going to just be able to scrape that into like a plastic bag in your, in your kitchen and then take the plastic bag and stick it in the organics or they don't even want that plastic bag in the organics? Um, they have, we've promoted, in, um, like in Costa Mesa, there's, there's green organics bags that you can have in a kitchen pail collection um, under your sink. Um, and you can put your organic waste in these uh, compostable bio bags, they're called, and then put that straight into your organic spin. That's okay. what I do at home, and that's what many of the residents do. They're small containers. Okay, so so they may have to get a separate cut of a bag to be able to throw it in there. Because I know, like you know, I've had my trash bin or containers for since you guys started, and literally they're super clean on the inside. I mean, you can almost yeah. eat off of them. And, you know, because we're careful about putting the trash in a bag, I know other people just throw everything in, in the bin. I certainly don't want to have to do that because of the, you know, the smell and the, and the possibility of vermin. So, so we would have to transition to maybe another different type of bag. Um, I'm assuming it's commercially sold, something like that. Yeah, yeah. Um, I got mine on Amazon. <laughs> <laughs> well, hopefully more available than that because uh, we got a well, lot. Well, no, yeah, it, yeah, you can get them at Mother's, you can get them at Sprouts, you can get them at oh, Target. But it's not something you're going to find at Ralph's or where, you know, Home Depot or wherever people buy. They, they have them at Home Depot. At Home Depot. Okay, good. Um, here's a question from Jeff Pettis. He says, what determines a city using a clean versus dirty MRF? Is it voted on by the city council? The determination is, is uh, more a factor of what's going in going into the cart the, the clean murph again is for clean separated recyclables the dirty murph is um, mixed with everything um, I think everybody's trying to get away from the dirty murph process um, both from a employee handling standpoint um, and a diversion standpoint it's it's really difficult to hit those diversion goals um, while also meeting the contamination requirements for the uh, end users. Nancy Skinner has a couple of questions. The first one is what about plastics? Reusable or just waste? Plastics is a big challenge. They're um, well re reusable. I'm not sure about the question, but ideally if you can reuse plastic, some of the restaurants now are giving away containers that can be reused over and over again. I'm seeing in the community, the, the school lunch programs are providing students with uh, lunches and plastic containers. And I see a lot of the parents uh, keeping those containers and reusing them for, for other items. So I, ideally, if you're receiving your items in a plastic container that can be reused, reuse them as much as possible. But um, um, plastics of all kinds are uh, are challenging and it, the, the markets for those really ebb and flow and they, they the markets follow um, the oil prices. So a few months ago when, when gas and oil was um, pretty cheap, plastics were cheaper to make brand new than they were to recycle. But the higher the oil prices go, the, uh, the more demand there is for recycled Interesting. Recyclable plastic. Interesting. So we're about out of time. Well, I think we're about out of time. One more, one more quick question. Well, I, actually, I had one last question, if you don't mind me asking. So all those uh, cans, uh, you know, aluminum Coke cans or crystal geyser water bottles that go into the recycling bin that are all, you know, subject to a, um, you know, the five cent recycling fee. So if you guys pick those up, do you guys get the nickels? We, um, we do. We get a portion of that nickel. If you're them. collecting them municipally, um, uh, you don't get the full refund from it. Okay. Well, I hope that I hope those portions hold down the cost of our uh, trash. We mm -hmm. are fortunate. I don't know that most people know this, but uh, we're the only city, pro probably in California, but certainly in Orange County, where the city actually pays for your trash pickup um, as opposed to the residents. And so that's been in place for as long as I know or I can remember. Um, I don't think the city is planning on doing away with that. 
but I think that there's some um, important decisions that our city council will be making over the next few months as to many of the things that we talked about, whether it's, you know, what, what our bin system is going to look like. Is there going to be just one size for everybody or will there be still, I think there's three sizes available now. I know I have at least right. two at my house and the larger one at a, another property I own. Um, you know, who's going to pay for the cost of this? The city just recently voted to increase our recycling fee, which is paid by the residents. Um, basically doubled from like three to six dollars and I think there's some more increases down the down the road but um, I imagine that the cost of picking up trash is not getting any cheaper as uh, all these state mandates are forced on uh, you know the residents and the cities um, and the trash haulers as well um, to uh, comply with them and, and you know to make the, the stream of, of, of trash flow from our houses to the landfills is as, as clean as possible. So um, I'll, with that being said, I'll, I'll thank you for being here. Welcome to stay and listen to the uh, reports that we have. We actually picked up uh, Ash Alvandi. I saw he signed on too. So we have four of the legislative reps, all four of them here to give uh, quick five minute updates. So I'm going, and sorry, we did have a lot more questions um, in our Q and A. I thank uh, everybody for submitting those. Fortunately, uh, we ran a little short on time to get to them. So I'm going to upgrade, let's see here. Uh, come on, participants. Start with Ash. Yeah, uh, okay, sure, we'll start with Ash. So I'm gonna put him on here uh, more and there you go, Ash. Ash, you can give us an update if you would uh, on what's keeping Senator Men busy at the time. Here he comes. There he is. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you, Rush and Steve, for having me as always. And uh, Mike, appreciate that presentation. Uh, yeah, Senator Urban's definitely been very busy. Uh, I guess a couple of things that are probably of relevance to everyone here. SB 87, the Small Business Relief Grant Bill, is doing another round of applications uh, April 28th through May 4th. Senator's principal co-author. So please feel free to reach out to our office if you haven't already applied. Uh, we'd love to help you all with your applications. And if you have already applied, uh, they're going to be using the previous rounds in the uh, new rounds that they're um, activating. What are the size of those grants? Uh, it's up to 25,000. Up to 25. So, uh, yeah. Same program there from five we, to 25,000. We submitted for one. So anything you can do to <laughs> expedite our application uh, for the Chamber of Commerce, we appreciate it. <laughs> Of course, appreciate that. And uh, yeah, we're, we're pushing for more rounds and pushing for uh, continued relief for businesses here. So uh, definitely appreciate that a lot of folks uh, in the district are, are struggling. Uh, a couple more bills we're working on. Uh, SB 500 uh, is moving through committee here. That would move along our, uh, move us more quickly towards the usage of electric vehicles, uh, specifically for autonomous driving. Um, we are working on a bill that would allow common interest developments, HOAs, to continue their emergency meetings uh, and allow them to do their elections uh, virtually. Um, and another one that potentially has some relevance here, SB 719, the Turp uh, Tustin Surplus Lands Act, uh, is actually going to uh, work to facilitate the development of the old Tustin military base, uh, the hangars that I'm sure everyone has been wondering what's going to be happening with those um, the senators working on with Tustin to uh, try and see if we can get those uh, you know, the folks that are going to work on them. Uh, and then continuing along here, the center is also working on SB 408, which uh, probably have even more relevance uh, to the folks here in your chamber. Uh, they will provide direct tax relief to businesses or specifically restaurants, bars, and hotels who operated during 2021 and 2020 uh, during the pandemic, um, allowing them to get a, a larger tax relief. Um, the specifics are still being ironed out, but uh, we are pushing for as much relief for our small businesses as possible. Um, and then also a relevant uh, SB 285, the Senator signed on to a bill that will provide 45 million. Uh, it's called the California Tourism Recovery Act. Uh, that would uh, I think it speaks for itself. I love it when the bills have names. Uh, it makes it a lot easier in the Senate here. We have uh, numbers for everything and I'm always throwing them around. The last thing, uh, which again, most of you are probably aware, we passed the uh, California wildfire budget, uh, pushed through some of the emergency action items there. So we'll have some preventative measures in place potentially uh, moving forward through the year. Um, and in addition, I think that the Senate 
and the assembly are hard at work to try and see what we can do for uh, PPP reciprocity, uh, specifically AB80 uh, was the last uh, written out uh, measure that we had. Well, yeah, it sounds so like your office is pretty busy. Definitely been uh, been a fun uh, couple months and appreciate you all inviting us back here to, to give an update. I'd be happy to take any questions if there's anything for our office or uh, if not, I'll put my information in the chat here uh, if anyone wants to reach out directly to me. Yeah, that would be great. Just put it right here, uh, contact information in the chat and they can reach you directly. All right, uh, why don't we move on to uh, Robert Labonte. He's with, uh, we'll go to the other side of the legislature, state legislature, and um, he represents. Connie Petrie. Connie Petrie North. North. That's right. Good morning. Good morning. Hey, Steve. Uh, thanks for having me on. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, yeah, so just an update. Uh, my name is Robbie. I'm with the Office of the Assemblywoman, Cotty Petrie Norris. Um, and we've been pretty busy these past couple of months uh, now that legislation is back in session. Um, so some of the bills and things we've been working on. Uh, first up would be um, AB 1158. Uh, which is going to ensure that licensed drug abuse recovery and treatment facilities and recovery residences uh, that contract with the government uh, maintain minimum insurance coverage levels um, to protect those patients from abuse or injury. Um, so obviously us being in a really nice spot, um, we've attracted a lot of these, a lot of these um, types of businesses and we want, want to make sure they got proper regulation um, to keep them safe and keep our community safe. Um, Next up is gonna be AB 689, uh, which we've uh, introduced. Um, and that one's gonna support the expansion of domestic violence crisis hotline services uh, to include computer chat and phone text platforms. Um, and it was passed as the Assembly's Public Safety Committee uh, with unanimous support. So um, some community safety issues. And then uh, lastly, what I wanted to talk about was uh, AB 953, um, which is uh, which is the Assembly's Revenue Tax Committee, uh, we voted un unanimously to support that, um, and that'll incentivize uh, the innovation of life-saving therapies uh, like the COVID vaccine, um, and so it, it, it helps make it possible for life science companies to perform uh, that research and development um, that will hopefully end the pandemic. So. Uh, that's a brief update for me on, on uh, the bills that we've been working on at the Assemblywoman's office. And uh, thank you for having me. Very good. Thank, thank you, Robbie. Uh, so let's move over to um, Avery Counts with uh, the new uh, supervisor, Katrina Foley's office, District 2. Good morning. Thank you so much. And thank you to the chamber for uh, allowing us to join and give an update. I'll be really brief. Uh, the supervisor has been hard at work. Uh, we're about three weeks now in uh, to the term. Uh, she had her first meeting uh, the other day this week, which was a lively meeting with a lot of public comments. Um, and she had a really good time on the dais and kind of learning exactly what, uh, what the Board of Supervisors does during these meetings, uh, very important. And then on top of that, the vaccination site at the fairgrounds is up and running. Uh, it's been providing a lot of vaccines to anybody who wants it once they get an appointment and uh, will continue to do so for the foreseeable future. And as well as that, we have some upcoming mobile vaccine pods as well in uh, harder hit uh, zip codes and communities, um, a lot of disadvantaged communities that, you know, don't have time to take off work uh, to go get the vaccine. Maybe they don't have a car or something like that. So we bring it to them so that anybody who wants the vaccine is able to get one. I'm going to put my information in the chat as well. Uh, I cover Newport for our office and we are really excited to uh, to keep working hard and uh, see you guys a lot more. Great. Uh, just a quick couple quick questions, Avery, on the vaccination program. So with the, uh, the stoppage and the J&J &J, um, vac vaccine for at least the time being, is that affecting um, appointments or, you know, ability to, you know, get vaccina vaccinated here in Orange County? Or do we have uh, from what, to, to, to cover it? Sure. From what I can tell, uh, it doesn't seem to be having very much of a major impact. Uh, most of the big vaccine pods here are Pfizer or Moderna. 
as is. Uh, I know some pharmacies, uh, you know, independent places are doing uh, Johnson and Johnson. Um, I believe they'll be able to switch. Uh, don't quote me on that, but um, we're going to be working with them as well to make sure that, you know, that it doesn't cause some sort of backlog in appointments that people don't get their appointments canceled, that sort of deal. But Pfizer and Moderna are by far the majority of the vaccine. In Orange County. I think the big news today is that anybody 16 and over, well, yeah, anybody 16 and over can now go get a, a, a mm -hmm. right? Absolutely. So if you haven't gotten it yet, folks, sign up. I get my second dose tomorrow. It's pretty quick, pretty easy. Great. And lastly, um, I want to compliment the county. Um, you know, we watch the coronavirus indicator pretty closely here at the chamber. And, um, the, uh, you know, when they first started with that health equity metric, it was pretty lopsided, uh, you know, that, and that's, for people who don't know, the health equity metric and the, uh, the positivity percentages are, you know, basically how many people are getting corona, you know, the percentage of people tested that are getting or have coronavirus. And so the health equity metric was in the most disadvantaged areas of the county. And that was, you know, much more, it seemed like much more virus in those areas, but um, over the, the months now, that is narrowed to almost being identical. So uh, congratulations for, you know, working in the areas like Anaheim and Santa Ana and things like that, where they had high levels of, uh, of people catching uh, coronavirus. And now that seems to have been, uh, you know, under control. So thank you again. Thank All you. Right, so Let's move on to our uh, last um, speaker here, and that's going to be Austin Mejia. And I'll just uh, get him up here. One second. And Austin, you are now promoted to panelist. Austin's with uh, Congresswoman Michelle Steele's office. And uh, oops, did we get him? There he comes. Good morning, Austin. Good morning. Hello. Thank you for having me. Uh, so, I have a quick update. Um, Congresswoman Michelle Steele just joined the SALT caucus, and that's a bipartisan caucus uh, focusing on uh, redu or, um, implementing the state and local tax deductions for taxpayers of the 40th Congressional District. So, she just announced right now uh, live that she's um, joined that. Next month, I will have an update about the uh, infrastructure plan and infrastructure bill, and we'll talk about, uh, you know, uh, our office's position on that one. Uh, just a quick update. Uh, May 3rd is our last day for uh, accepting uh, art for the Congressional Art Competition, and that's for high school age students. They have the great honor of having their uh, artwork displayed in the Capitol, and so that's, you know, uh, something that should be celebrated, and so we're accepting art, and so, you know, we're trying to get the word out to all the high school uh, age students. Uh, Congresswoman Michelle Steele's office took part in the uh, Hate Free HB event last week, and so we just wanted to uh, make sure to reiterate that we denounce all that type of uh, activity going on right next door in Huntington Beach. And uh, our office is always open to uh, members of the community and members of the chamber for casework, including what would be, you know, most applicable for SBA grants. But we could also help people with even small things like getting their passports renewed in time for trips. Now that uh, you know vacation is starting to happen again because of the vaccinations, and uh, you know we've been uh, also doing a lot of casework for veterans affairs issues and for issues with the IRS. So uh, it's sometimes very difficult to contact the IRS, and so we could be a uh, you know bridge to uh, that agency for um, constituents. And so I will put my information in the chat as well. And we appreciate you know the chamber allowing us time to uh, provide these quick updates. Thank Great. you very much. Thank you for thank joining you us for, this morning. Uh, and thank you to Mr. Kerry for that presentation this morning. I found it very, you know, informative about all the state legislation. Yeah, yeah. I thought the, the information about uh, the anaerobic digesters and all that and how, you know, the organics actually, you can basically get 100%, whether it's the, the energy or the um, recyclable or, you know, the composting and all that other stuff. So, all right. Um, I think that's, uh, we're right on schedule here. So, um, I'll just conclude with mentioning that we have a couple of great upcoming programs. Um, on May 6th, our uh, normal uh, day to meet for Wake Up Newport, and Rush and I will be hosting that as well. Um, we're pleased to uh, be able to announce that we have Alan Zarenberg. He's the president and CEO of the California Chamber of Commerce, will be our speaker. 
he's he's spoken in, in person actually he flew down from sacramento a couple of years ago to speak uh, to our group at uh, the library super interesting and knowledgeable speaker um, highly recommend you joining us for that. You can sign up for all of our events at newportbeach.com. Um, he's going to be talking about you know, a lot of this legislation that's bouncing around in, in Sacramento. I mean, to make your head spin um, as a businessman. To, if, if all that stuff passed, you might as well just lock your door and, and move away uh, to some other country. Even I, I don't even know another state. You'd be so stunned by what uh, is being pr promoted up there. So, uh, you know, Chamber um, takes positions on those bills and um, and fights against the ones that, uh, you know, are, are uh, not business friendly. So it'll be interesting to hear Alan's take on that. And then um, next month at our Government Affairs Committee meeting, um, actually Katrina Foley will be our speaker, the new uh, second district supervisor who we just received a report from um, Avery. So um, with that being said, uh, Rush, do you have any uh, concluding remarks? No, I'm uh, absolutely pleased that we uh, held you to the uh, time limit uh, on your dissertation. And, uh... <laughs> and I want to thank Mike again as well. Thanks for coming back on the screen there, Mike. Great presentation. Um, you know, it's uh, something that we a lot of people don't really think about. You know, they throw the trash in the can and they figure it disappears, you know, once a week. But you know, there's a lot of work that needs to get done once uh, it leaves our homes and businesses and uh, it's not getting any easier not getting any cheaper and uh and we will have to all just you know make some changes as we move forward and and how we you know deal with the trash um so uh i imagine that you know there'll be council meetings coming up people who are interested should monitor that and you know as the city council makes these decisions on you know, two bins versus three bins and the size of the bins and, you know, even commercial waste, you know, there's talk of maybe going to a two or three or four haulers as opposed to, uh, you know, 18 or 20 haulers that we have now to limit the number of trucks on the street. So there's a lot of activity in the trash area. I'm glad we were able to cover it this morning. And uh, for the rest of you, have a great uh, rest of your week and weekend, and we'll see you um, hopefully in May for Wake Up Newport. Thank Thanks you. for attending. Thanks, Mike. Bye-bye. Thank Thanks, guys.